Hi, this is Jason Kelly with The Kelly Letter, here to talk with you today about the upcoming presidential election. This is a big one, and I know from emails, phone calls, text messages that I've received from readers and subscribers that you're worried about it. People are anxious. They know that the stakes are high, that the vision for the country is very different between the two candidates, and many people honestly feel that if their side loses, the country will be irrevocably harmed. As an extension of that, they're worried about what it's going to mean to the stock market, what it's going to do to their portfolio, their bottom line, their future plans. I am not here today to minimize those fears. I want to put that right up front. What I want to do, though, is step away from the political turmoil and focus in closely on the effect on the stock market of the last presidential elections of this century so you can see that short-term volatility works out in the end. I firmly believe that every price pressure in the market, any kind of volatility, is best navigated with a rules-based long-term portfolio that's built on the foundations of stock market history. That's what ours are at the Kelly Letter, and there are other versions of this approach to the stock market as well. If you are approaching the market that way and not trading, not trying to time, keep doing what you're doing. That will work through whatever unfolds, and it will keep you on that long-term path to prosperity that you very carefully created for yourself. With that in mind, let's step away from the politics and zoom in on what the stock market has done through the past presidential elections of this century. Come along with me. Let's get started now. All right. Here we have recent presidential elections for me to show you that they've all been nail biters. It's not just 2024. This list goes from the year 2000 up through 2020. And what I've done here is highlighted just how close each election was with a yellow highlight and then also in bold. Back in 2000, it was George W. Bush versus Al Gore. The winner was Bush with 47.9% of the popular vote. However, Gore won 48.4% of the popular vote. So this was one of those rare times where the winner of the Electoral College did not win the popular vote. And that's not so rare these days, and we may see that again. That's one of the things people are talking about as a possibility for the 2024 election. This was quite a contested election back in 2000. There was a Florida recount from November 7th to December 12th. That's when the Supreme Court ended it. That was settled in Bush's favor. You ready for this? By a margin of 537 votes out of 5,825,043 cast. This is the percentage of that, 0.0092%. That is the margin that determined the winner in 2000. And look how long this, this election was contested and recounted. It was, it was a, a real nail biter, much more than ones we've seen since then. And we pulled out of it just fine. I remember I was in Los Angeles at the time, and I remember people driving around town with, with flags and, and, and banners on the cars. And one of them said, during this November to December 12th period, one of the signs said, we don't need a president. We can do fine with no president, because it felt like we had no president during that period. And it goes to show that, that, that rancorous, volatile, highly emotional elections are nothing new. That one in 2000 was quite a doozy. It was followed by the election of 2004, George W. Bush versus John Kerry. The winner of that one, Bush, no, no difference between the Electoral College and the popular vote this time, but look at that margin, 50.7%. Another coin toss, even up here where it seems like, oh, he won by a lot up here. First of all, he didn't win the popular vote, but look how close it was again. Statistically, all of these elections are quite close to coin tosses, and here we are in another one like that. But the key takeaway today is that what we're seeing right now ahead of the 2024 election is not unusual by presidential election history. In 2008, it was Barack Obama versus John McCain. The winner was Obama with 52.9% of the popular vote. In 2012, it was Obama versus Mitt Romney. Obama won again with 51.1% of the popular vote. In 2016, Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. The winner of this was Trump with 46.1% of the popular vote. And here again, Clinton actually won more of the popular vote, even though Trump won the Electoral College. So Clinton had 48.2, Trump had 46.1. And then in 2020, it was Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. Biden won with 51.3% of the popular vote. 
and he also won the Electoral College. However, Trump protested the result. There, I know people disagree on what happened, but this is taken from Wikipedia for me to try to remain as anodyne as possible politically here. Quote, on January 6, 2021, the United States Capitol building in Washington, D.C. was attacked by a mob of supporters of then U.S. President Donald Trump in an attempted self-coup d'etat two months after his defeat in the 2020 presidential election. Now notice we've bookended this, this list with two highly rancorous e elections. In 2000, there was a recount for more than a month in Florida, and the winner of that was this slim of a margin. So we didn't have a president, felt like. We didn't have a president for that entire time, and people were saying, we don't need a president. That's how, that's how wild that one was. And in 2020, we had the January 6th Capitol attack, I suppose. Those are pretty volatile. So now people are saying we're heading into what could be the worst election ever. It's, it's the most important of all. It could result in a civil war. It's so close, too close to call. People are on edge. They're going to flip out. And that's going to just kill the stock market along with everything else. Let's set the record straight. There doesn't seem to be anything different about this year's election than the others in terms of how close it is right now, how close it probably will be in the outcome, and that there will probably be some, some shuffling around afterwards as people, it might be contested again, it might be fought in the courts, but we've seen that before, right? Now, let's go through what impact these different elections had on the stock market. We're going to start with the full market over this entire time period. All right, this is going back to 2000 here and all the way up to where we are here, the end of October in 2024. I like to zoom out just to show this is basically the trajectory of the stock market. It's been quite a lift in the last 15 years or so coming out of the subprime mortgage crash. And let's just put a few big milestones on here. This, this decline here is the dot-com crash. It, the, the market peaked here in, in, in the early 2000s. It went down for a couple of years. That's what you're seeing here. This next one, a sharper crash, was the subprime mortgage crash. That, that was it's usually called the financial crisis of 2008, but it was sparked by subprime mortgages collapsing in the United States, and that's what you're seeing here. Up here, this wasn't really much. At the time, though, this was talked about in media as a really big deal. We've got a double bottom. We're going to keep crashing to zero. And you see how that went. Lesson to note. The next big drop, I'd say, was up in, up in here. This is, this is the tech wreck of 2018. It was a big deal, especially in the fourth quarter of 2018. And it was an excellent buying opportunity, by the way, for anyone who was running rules-based plans like, oh, I don't know, the Kelly Letters 9 SIG. That was the tech wreck. This is, of course, the COVID crash of 2020. And this is the Federal Reserve interest rate panic of 2022 in reaction to post-pandemic inflation. So I would interpret this as a general upward trajectory interrupted a few big times by these major events that I've just noted here. All right. Now, along the way, we had presidential elections. I phrase it that way to point out that it's really not the most important thing that happens along the stock market line. The, the stock market is more affected by monetary policy, that's the Federal Reserve and the Fed funds rate, economic data, which are a result of many, many, many influences, not just presidential policies, and uh, earnings of companies, of course, which are a result of those two other factors. And, of course, how, how management does and just how, how companies are faring. Innovation and so on plays a very big part. Has not nothing to do with presidents. It's just that presidents aren't the primary factor. They're certainly not the only factor. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, this is the S&P 500 via the Spider ETF symbol SPY. And that's the same, same security I'm going to use for all of these comparisons. Now, back to our presidential election um, rundown here. We're going to zoom in on this one, the year 2000, Bush v. Gore. That's when Bush won with 47.9% of the popular vote, but, but that wasn't the most. Gore actually won more. In the end, after the Florida recount, Bush won by this tiny bit of a margin and ended up becoming president. That's what we're going to zoom in on now in the stock market. Here we are. This is the same spider ETF for the, the S&P 500, year 2000, Bush v. Gore. Here's the election right here. Now, what was going on then? 
Is this a result of the election? It's tempting to think so, and many members of financial media commentary will tell you that kind of thing. Look at this. The stock market doesn't like how this election is going. That's what they were saying that year. Doesn't like this. The stock market is not liking our prospects for this election. What a load. That wasn't what was happening at all. This is the, this is the dot-com crash. That's what's going on here. At the beginning of the year, the stock market began crashing because the dot-com bubble had burst. And so down went stocks. They were still going down. In the middle of them going down, we had a presidential election. And by the way, you'll notice here, this is probably a coincidence too, but just by chance, in the last month run up to the election, stocks did pretty well. And then people were saying they're hopeful that candidate A is going to win. For example, like Bush is going to win. No, Gore is going to win. That's why stocks are rising. All of it was irrelevant noise. Right after the election, stocks crashed. You can imagine what people said then. Well, it's because of all this rancor that we don't know who the president is yet. Is it Bush? Is it Gore? It might be Gore. That's why stocks are tanking. The Democrat is no good for stocks and those kind of comments, which are all wrong, but they happen every single cycle. Well, as it was resolved, however, it does look pretty clear on here. You can see where someone would say, hmm, after the election, right away, when we didn't have a clear winner, stocks crashed. As soon as we got a clear winner here in early December, stocks took off and did better. Fine. But the point really is timing stocks based on a presidential election is no easier than timing at any other point, and it never works. So I wouldn't try to do it around the 2024 election either. Once again, let's zoom in on the big long-term chart here. We were just looking now right here at the election. Look, look at how irrelevant it looks on the big picture. And I would say even on the, the small picture, the zoomed-in picture, it looks fairly irrelevant to what was going on at the time, which was the dot-com crash. Now we're going to go to the 2004 election. This is when President Bush defeated John Kerry with 50.7% of the vote. Let me zoom in on that one. So that's 2004. Here's what that looked like. 2004, Bush versus Kerry. Here's the election. Stocks were rising ahead of it. They dropped just before the election. And then they started rising, well, I guess just before the election they were rising. But, but before that, during most of October, they were declining. Then they popped up before the election and kept going up dramatically after the election. People said, see, the Republican is better for stocks, which is not true. They're irrelevant. I'm not advocating Republicans or Democrats for the stock market in any way. Don't, don't take that away from this. Probably what was going on, if we have to provide a narrative to this, is simply that the stock market was pleased and relieved at the continuity. We had President Bush after the election. We still had President Bush. Oh, good. Nothing's going to change. Let's keep making money. That's how I would interpret this chart. That was 2004. Here's how that looked on the big chart. 2004, here's where we were. All of that was just this. Isn't that amazing? All of that was just this. When you zoom out, nothing means anything. <laughs> just the long-term trend of the stock market, all right? Now, we go back to our presidential rundown here. 2008. Barack Obama versus John McCain. Obama wins with 52.9% of the popular vote. Here's what that looked like in the stock market. Ahead of it, stocks were crashing. Again, the commentary, it said, oh, the stock market doesn't like what's on offer this time. We don't have any good candidates you know, coming out of the Bush years. This is looking like a catastrophe. Nope. What was going on here in year 2008 was... The subprime mortgage crash, okay? Started here, headed on down here. We have an election in the middle of this crash. The election has no impact whatsoever on the crash. Stocks keep crashing because they really are not affected by presidential elections. That's the theme we're going to take away here. So ahead of the election, the entire election year, stocks are crashing, stocks are crashing. Here's the election in early November. Stocks keep crashing. And then they finally bounce later of the month and they go flat for a while and the correction continues a while longer into 2009. But then we start coming out of it very boldly. Was that President Obama's credit? Nope. Was that, was, no. It just had absolutely nothing to do with the presidential election cycle. Here's the big chart again. We, uh, the elections held here. 
President Obama comes into office right here, has no time to get any sort of policies in place, and then off goes this major bull market that we're really, in a sense, still riding today. It looks pretty clear, boom, up from the bottom in 2009. What would, what is the real narrative here? If we're going to give any sort of credit or blame to, to a president, the, the blame for this would go to President Clinton because it was during his administration that, that banks were deregulated and President Bush didn't have a whole clue, a clue the whole time he was in office what was going on, didn't do anything to stop what, what was happening in the mortgage market, and right here it all came to a head at the end of President Bush's time. He was leaving office. The market was working things out anyway. By the time President Obama got in, things were already in progress to, to rescue financial markets, and out they came. It wasn't President Bush's fault. It wasn't President Obama's credit. They just happened to be there as these events were unfolding. Back to our presidential election list here. Um, that was 2012, so uh, that was 2008, sorry. In 2012, we had Barack Obama versus Mitt Romney. President Obama won with 51.1% of the vote. Here's what that looked like on the stock chart. Year 2012, Obama versus Romney. Pretty volatile year, actually. Here we are from August, bouncing up, going back down toward the election. The election happens here in early November. Stocks keep going down a little farther with this downtrend that had started ahead of the election. It bottoms shortly afterwards and take off pretty nicely. You could interpret that, and I would interpret that, not as, as necessarily that, that President Obama was great for stocks, but just that continuity was maintained. Stocks dislike uncertainty, so keeping a president is a lot easier than changing to somebody new and not knowing what they're going to do. We saw it with Bush's re-election, and we see it with Obama's re-election here. But there was volatility around the election, down in front, up afterwards, but sometimes it's up afterwards, up in front, down afterwards, so I really wouldn't try to time it. Just pointing out that there's short-term volatility that works out over time. There's 2012. Look at that, the volatility ahead of time, and doesn't it look like just a momentary blip, speed bump, dip in the road on the, the way higher? It does to me, as do they all. 2016, Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Some would argue this is the start of the modern era, certainly the start of the Trump era, right? Literally. So Donald Trump won this with 46.1% of the popular vote, but of course, Hillary Clinton won most of the popular vote with 48.2, but Donald Trump carried the Electoral College. That was a nail biter, and everyone said the future of the country is at stake here. And this is what it looked like zoomed in. Year 2016, Trump versus Clinton. Pretty standard volatility ahead of time, but quite a down shot here and quite a bounce after the election was over. Is that because President Trump won and people expected a better economy as a result? He has always had strong marks in the economic corner, and he does this year too, 2024. So it's possible that that was why. And we can't argue that it was continuity because he was a new president and he was the other party. So it's possible that this one was because investors thought that stocks and the economy would be better under President Trump. Hard to say for sure. I'm, I'm not really sure we'll ever know. But this is what the chart looked like. Volatility in front. Quite a drop down ahead of the election. Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? And quite a moonshot after the election when the winner was President Trump. How did that look on the big chart? Like this in 2016. Um, that There's that volatility in front. There's that dip down. And there's the moonshot out of there that just kept going. Just kept going. And President Trump likes to take credit for all this, 2016 through 2020. Fine, but you can see here that we've had quite a quite an upward trajectory over time. And if, if I took this chart back farther than just back to 2000, you'd see that this is what stocks look like over the long haul always. Presidents come and go, stocks keep rising over time, with generally about one big crash per decade and lots of volatility in between. That's the story of stocks, and it's not really affected much by different presidents. Back to our presidential list. Here we are with... The last election, 2020, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. Biden won this with 51.3% of the popular vote. Now, this was, again, quite a, quite a wild ride, right? Because Trump protested that result, and it led to the January 6th Capitol attack. I would argue that was the worst outcome of a presidential election in recent times. Let's zoom in and see what it did to the stock market.
Here we are in 2020. Surprised? Not so bad, was it? Stocks were, I'd call that again, pretty normal volatility ahead of time, especially for autumn. So there it is. We did get this drop down into the election. And then right after the election, slightly before things started looking up, people have argued, various investors have argued, that's because we started to know that Biden was going to win. And, and it's just nice to know who the winner is going to be. The main thing I would note here is that stocks shot up right away and kept going up convincingly right through that capital attack on January 6th, right? I mean, here it is here. Stocks rose right up into it. All the way through here, there was a fight about the election result. Court filings, speeches, promises of reversals and so on, claims of fraud, and it culminated in, in that January 6th capital attack here. Did stocks even notice? If, if we weren't talking about the events that happened here, would you have any clue that anything was going on that might possibly bother stocks? Not really. Then comes the inauguration. People might say, look, there you go. There's your evidence that stocks didn't like the outcome. Yeah, except we, we do have to keep coming back to this, don't we? So there it is. 2021 is when things started here. There's, there's that dip that you started to see, right? That, that's 2020. There's, there's that dip right there after the inauguration, but you can see once again on the big chart that it, it didn't really matter much where we're here. 2021, there we go. And basically the recovery after COVID just continued until we got up to here, which had nothing to do with, I would argue, had, had little to do with President Biden's policies. It was really all about the Federal Reserve panicking and cranking rates higher in reaction to pandemic inflation pandemic caused inflation by supply chain shutdowns. And, and after that, we've had quite a nice, almost parabolic run higher from the bottom of that 2022 interest rate panic crash. So there you go. There's the story of the entire run of elections recently, every one of which has been quite close, right? Every one of them has in different ways, different outcomes, different parties taking control through it all, this is what stocks have done, and it's pretty encouraging, I think. You will see some short-term volatility. Let's do the quick pictures again. There's 2000. There's 2004. Here's 2008. Here's 2012. Here's 2016. And there's 2020. So what will 2024 bring? Well, some volatility, no doubt. But will it, be, will it be catastrophic? I doubt it. It'll be volatility that will be worked out over the long haul the way we've seen many times before. It's not going to be the outcome of this election that drives stocks over the next many years, the next four years, the next many more years than that. We have a lot going on in the world. It has little to do with the presidential election. Monetary policy matters a lot. Key interest rates are declining. Inflation looks to be whipped. It might go up a little bit. And one of the concerns is that, that the candidates, depending how the outcome goes of this election, but we might get a new round of inflation from, from this election, depending on who becomes president and what the policies, what the policies do to the economy. But we, we can't foresee that. There's, there's just no way. Understand that, that before every election you hear this, and you've seen the results of them, right? So I believe we're going to have short-term volatility we already have had some short-term volatility, and in the long run, we're going to get back to what stocks do, which is rise over time based on rising earnings, because companies navigate whatever unfolds and do do well over time. Is it close again this year? Absolutely. For that, now just a reminder, there, there are the past elections. Look how close they were. Basically 50-50 all along, right? And here we are again. This is the this is the Silver Bolton. It's Nate, Nate Silver's forecasting service. And this is his latest chart as of, you can see down here, October 29th. Look how close it is again. Back here the, in springtime and into early summer, Trump had a convincing lead when President Biden was the candidate. When President Biden dropped out, things began to change. There was a great excitement around, around Vice President Harris coming in. And Trump declined, Harris rose, and she stayed a lot higher until recently. And look how much things are tightening up now. 
This is being interpreted as as Trump momentum into the election, which has led some investors to start maneuvering their portfolios to prepare for a Trump victory. But we honestly don't know. Even Nate Silver says there's no way to tell from the polls. And basically every other poll shows 50-50. It's very close in the battleground states, very close nationally. It's another coin toss, and I bet you anything we're going to be able to add to this, and it's going to look very similar down here. 2024, someone will have won with a coin toss probably even much narrower than this. It's, it might even be narrower than this one in 2004 when Bush won by just that little. It's probably going to be another nail-biter. At least right now, there's, I'm, there's no point to forecast here. I'm just, just saying that it, it feels close right now. That's what Nate Silver is pointing out here. It's very close. We've had many close elections, and through them all, the stock market has looked like this. That's critical, all right? Now, there are people saying, what if it's different this time? What if it's not just an ordinary election? I pointed out this seems unusually safe for investors in the country to me because both candidates, Trump and Harris, have been in the White House for four years. Each one has time in the White House. We don't have to speculate about their records. We know how the country is done with each of them in the White House. And look how well it's done. Here's, I mean, this is when it started, right? The, the Trump-Harris time in office, Trump here, and then Harris with Biden starting here, Stocks have been fine throughout, and the times they've taken a dip had nothing to do. This is with the president. COVID crash, Fed interest rate panic, right? So it seems like, on this chart, to me at least, that we shouldn't have much to worry about because we already know stocks have been fine through the first two terms of each of these candidates. The pushback against that is that this time is different, that specifically... Trump was, was contained by people who wanted to, to, to keep things normal and follow a, a fairly standard path for the United States. But this time, he has rigged the courts and he's surrounded himself by people who are, are, are yes men and will support anything he wants to do. And he has terrible designs on the country and he's not going to even allow future elections and so on. I, I don't really see evidence for that, but many people do. Let's just acknowledge that. Half the country seems to think that if Trump gets into office, it's going to be some sort of Nazi Germany situation again. I'm not going to go into that hyperbole. What I will acknowledge, though, is that President Trump does talk a lot about tariffs. And it is possible that Trump's policies of erect, uh, in enacting tariffs would drive up prices so much we get another round of inflation which would cause the Federal Reserve to reverse its course on interest rates and instead of reducing them, would either pause the reduction or actually raise them again to combat inflation, that Trump wouldn't like that and would go after the Federal Reserve's independence. Now, this is all hypothetical, but if that happened and if the bond market particularly wondered if the Fed was losing its independence, there could indeed be a big crash. And if we look on this, this chart, it might look something like this. I suppose that would be closest to the, the subprime mortgage crash of 2008 because it would be financially based. It would be the White House fighting the Federal Reserve, the United States Central Bank, about a critical economic and financial market factor. So that seems closer to this type of crash, which was based on, on financial instruments, subprime mortgages. But who knows? Who knows, right? Some people blame this crash partly on the Biden-Harris administration for their inflation exacerbating policies. But as I mentioned earlier, almost all of this came from the pandemic shutdown. So who knows, really? Just who knows? It, it, you, you don't know. Look, look at the layers of not knowing here. You don't know who's going to win. You don't know what the person who does win is going to do in office. You don't know how those policies are going to affect the economy. You don't know how the economy is going to affect the stock market. And you don't know how investors are going to react to where the stock market goes. So you don't know what the stock market is going to do in reaction to what the economy does to the policies of the person who's elected, and you don't know who that is. So the, the, the layers of uncertainty are so deep here, I find it comical when people say, I'm preparing my portfolio for the outcome. Okay. Good luck with that. I'm looking at this long line and preparing for it to continue because it's gone on this way my entire life and I expect it to keep doing so. Now, 
Is it possible that if the United States went went totally fascist and 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 became like Nazi Germany, that stocks would be a bad place to invest? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, based on history, it's possible that a country can totally blow itself to pieces in a way that ruins the stock market. I would say for that, we would probably turn to, well, my favorite book on the subject is, let me just show you here, Wealth, War, and Wisdom by Barton Biggs, who, and this was published by Wiley back in December 2010. Barton Biggs was, was, uh, well, let me look at my notes here. I, I used to read Biggs a lot. He, he passed away, but he, he was a longtime Morgan Stanley executive, and he was an amazing researcher. And a lot of his research came together in this book, which I liked very much. It's, it's a whole book, and we can't summarize it now. But the main takeaway related to this is that in almost all cases, it's better to keep, it was better to keep investing in stocks. But for the big calamities, the major, major points in history, there were times it was better to be out of stocks. One of those is Nazi, Nazi Germany. That in, in the case of that, the, the Nazi era completely destroyed Germany's economy. Um, some others involved in the war were destroyed too. Japan's economy was in a shambles until later when things rebuilt. But it is true that if you had been a wealthy person in Germany when the Nazis rose up in the 1920s and 30s, you would have been better off owning gold, diamonds, uh, food, putting away things like weapons, and frankly, leaving the country. So that's true. We have to acknowledge that that happened in history, that, that when, when Germany went, went to fascism, for real, not the fascism that's claimed every four years in America, but true, honest to God, fascism. The thing to do there financially, and, and but it's so much bigger than finance, doesn't it feel strange to talk about it that way? As if the main takeaway from World War II was to buy gold. I mean, come on. But if you are talking about just finances, then, then yes, the thing to have done would have been sell your stocks in Germany, buy a bunch of gold, pack up the bags, bundle up the kids, and leave the country. That's the advice. Does it really feel to you that we're at that point in the United States right now? We come back here to that long-term chart again. Here we are. I don't think so. I really don't think either of these candidates is Adolf Hitler and that we're going to go back, we're going to go to a situation that looks like Nazi Germany that was so bad, the way to survive that physically to get away with your life and to get away with some wealth was to buy gold and other real assets and vacate the country. I don't think we're going there. I think we're going to have an election that looks like this. It's going to be close, but it's going to be doable. And you saw what each of those charts looked like, and they all added up to this one over the long haul. I believe that's what we're in for, which means you should stick with your rules-based plans. Now let me go back with a closing comment for you. Just a moment. So there you go. Thanks for zooming in with me on the elections of this century how tight the polls are now, how tight the polls were, and the results were in the other elections of this century so far. As I mentioned at the top, I know emotions are running high. I know that everybody thinks this, uh, the, the country's on the line, and that's a fair assessment. Politically, I, I know how important this is. I, I will be doing my part, and I'm sure you will be doing yours on Election Day. What I want you to take away from, from this video, though, is that your stock portfolio will be fine. I do not believe we're heading into a Nazi Germany situation where you're going to need to buy gold and leave the United States because of the outcome of the 2024 presidential election. It even feels silly describing it that way. There's probably going to be volatility. There are going to be people yelling on both sides. But ultimately, we're going to get a president, and the country is going to be fine. Each candidate on offer this time has spent four years, almost four years in the case of Harris, in the White House. And the country didn't collapse yet. It was fine through the Trump years. It's been fine through the Biden-Harris years. The troubles that each administration experienced in the stock market had little, if anything, to do with the presidential policies at the time. We're probably going into something like that. The odds certainly favor it. And what I hope to convey to you in this video is that you can set aside your stock market concerns to focus on your political concerns. Vote your heart. Vote what you think is right socially and politically for the country based on your analysis without taking into account what it might mean for the stock market. The stock market is going to be fine. 
no matter what happens in this election, so vote along other points of analysis. If you are still concerned about the, the, the election and the, the, the rancor that might unfold in the weeks ahead, and you're a subscriber, please feel free to jump on the subscriber site and interact with me and your fellow subscribers to soothe each other's nerves. It might feel good, at least to know that you're not alone. There are a lot of other smart people looking at this, and we will all still be here on the other side of the election. With that, I wish you a happy presidential election day. Thank you for watching.